I hope you're enjoying our musical selection. <laughs> that might be my email pinging. Oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> All right, I think so we can uh, keep to the, the time of the program. I will um, start. I know it's still trickling in, but hopefully uh, most everyone will, will hear the, the introduction. Um, so good evening and welcome to Reading the Library Company's Graphic Arts Collection, a conversation with librarian Emily Guthrie. I'm Piola, Curator of Graphic Arts, the Director of the Library's Visual Culture Program and Co-Curator of Imperfect History. Tonight, along with Senior Curator of Graphic Arts, Sarah Weatherwax, my exhibition co-curator, we will be looking at the graphics displayed in perfect history, not from the perspective of specialists in visual material and culture, as we have done in past programs. Instead, we will be conversing about the graphic arts collections from the perspective of an expert on textual materials, as we continue to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the graphic arts department. For those who have yet to explore the exhibition, it is at its core not only a look at the history of the collecting of graphics for nearly 300 years by the library company, but also an examination of the social dynamics and historical and cultural biases affecting that collecting and the reading of those visual materials then and now. Literacy, multiple perspectives, and the good, bad, and the ugly of the visual world of American popular graphic artworks are explored through the over 100 items on display. And now if you will so indulge me, as a matter of a little reminder housekeeping, please know your mics are muted and will be, remain muted throughout the program. In our discussion, there will be time for some audience Q&A. Please feel free to place your questions in the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen anytime during the program. I also wanted to quickly thank our funders for this project, Henry Luce Foundation, Walter J. Miller Trust, Center for American Art, Philadelphia Museum of Art, J. Robert Stiefel, and Terra Foundation for American Art. Now, before we move on to the introduction of our esteemed colleague, Emily Guthrie, we wanted to quickly share a brief video about the process for the Imperfect History Project, an exhibition that is also available in the gallery for our, for our on-site visitors, as well as available on our, excuse me, on our YouTube channel. We hope it provides a few more insights to our curatorial process in reading the collection before we continue the conversation with Emily. Please enjoy. To be an engaged citizen, you need to be visually literate. Scholarship is more open to the idea that there's a lot of value in images. Something that may have just been a cartoon that ran once in Harper's Weekly in 1863 those are really important objects to help us gauge, like what was the popular sentiment at the time? The full title, I just have to do it, is Imperfect History, Curating the Graphic Arts Collection at Benjamin Franklin's Public Library. Imperfect History is being held in honor of the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Graphic Arts Department. And we didn't want to just do a greatest hits. What we want to show is what the role of the curator is, the evolution of the collection that the, the curator is stewarding, as well as the imperfections of the curator and those collections. We wanted the exhibition to be more of an exploration of how, as a society, can we learn to read graphics like we, we have all learned to read text. We have over 100,000 items here in the graphic arts department. Many of our materials date to the 19th century, but we do have items such as maps that date as early as the 16th century. However, we no longer have the first graphic item that we found a record of coming in. And we're going to represent that in the exhibition by a empty frame. Most of our materials that depicted women or depicted African-Americans were not being produced by those groups. Something that I really appreciate about seeing the evolution is seeing how we've made a concerted effort to try and source materials that were produced by African-American lithographers or photographers. And we of course have a lot of materials that, for instance, when it comes to race or gender, depict a lot of stereotypes, like a trade card that's advertising a soap business. And you'd think, oh, like what can be so like socially charged about soap? But a lot of the trade cards in the 19th century that were promoting normal day-to-day -day things 
employed racist caricatures to do so. Nowadays, we can recognize that material sort of on a wholesale level as like really negative. Also, the recognition that different people bring different preconceived ideas to looking at visuals, and it doesn't mean that I'm right and you're wrong. It just means that you can look at it in many, many different ways. And I think that is one of the, the themes that we're trying to tease out in the exhibition. I am curating two sections within the exhibition. One is having me pick out a few objects and then for the three of us to each write labels for those objects without seeing what the others are writing. So then that way, when we come together and show each other the labels, we kind of see the differences and the similarities in how we interpreted them. We have a digital catalog, which does a similar concept where we had individuals who are curators, studio artists, and art historians look at the same three images and write a catalog entry to describe this image. And so that's a part of the Imperfect History exhibition. Again, kind of getting at the same idea that everyone brings their own knowledge and background and perspective to looking at something. I think it's the curator's job to really do the work of helping audiences understand like why were racist tropes being used to advertise like laundry soap. But also trying to look and anticipate how we potentially can guide new scholarship. I'm hoping that people will think about like, hey, this is how I'm looking at it today, but also think about like, hey, possibly this is what someone 200 years ago was thinking when they were looking at that material. I'm really hoping that people can start to think a little bit critically about their own experience of space in Philadelphia. We can't just be spoon-fed one narrative without thinking about others, so that's kind of what I'm hoping people come away with. I want people to have a much broader sense of why we should care about all of these visuals. Visual literacy, I think, is a good phrase to describe what we're hoping to promote. And now I'm going to turn over the Zoom floor to my colleague, Sarah Weatherwax. Thank you, Erica. I am pleased to have been given the next few minutes to introduce Emily Guthrie to all of you attending tonight's event. In April 2021, after a nationwide search, Emily joined the library company staff as librarian. A native Ohioan, Emily has also lived in the Appalachian Mountains of Western Maryland. Bar Harbor, Maine, Tucson, Arizona, Washington, D.C., Savannah, Georgia, and three cities in North Carolina before launching her library career at the Winneter Museum, Garden, and Library in 2005. Emily holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Historic Preservation from the Savannah College of Art and Design and a Master's in Library Science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In her role as a reference librarian at Winneter, she was able to unite her interests in art librarianship, historic preservation, and horticulture. While she had only planned to stay at Winneter for five years, opportunities presented themselves, and she went on to serve as the technical services librarian, NEH librarian for the printed book collection, and in 2017 was promoted to director of the library. She also worked closely with students in Winneter's graduate programs in American material culture and art conservation, becoming an assistant professor in the material culture program and teaching classes in the history of the book, design sources, and British design history. Sharing library collections through exhibitions has played an important role in Emily's library career. While earning her library degree, she curated an exhibition of over 200 objects relating to the life and work of William Chambers Coker, professor of botany, mycology enthusiast, and founder of the Coker Arboretum. At Winneter, she curated several small-scale library exhibitions on topics ranging from innovations in 19th and early 20th century clothing design to convenience cookbooks to the Saul Zalich collection of printed ephemera. I particularly like the title she selected for an exhibition she curated in 2017, Go to Your Room, Interior Design and the Childhood Imagination an exhibition that included pattern books, wallpaper sample books, home decorating manuals, scrapbook houses, and trade catalogs. Emily notes that it has been the honor of a lifetime to succeed Jim Green in the role of librarian for the library company, 
since she had been a secret admirer of the library company and its expert curatorial staff for many years. As I'm sure you can imagine, Emily's time at the library company has been greatly impacted by the pandemic. In the spring of 2021, when she started, the library company was closed to researchers and much of the staff, including those who were supposed to report to Emily, were largely working remotely from home. Emily has persevered through these challenges. 10 months in, she has immersed herself in getting to know the staff, the learning community, the collections, and the many complexities that made the library company such an exciting place to work. In her role as librarian, Emily has both administrative and curatorial duties. And this evening, we have asked her to put on her curator hat and provide us with a pre fresh perspective to viewing and thinking about the Imperfect History exhibition, and even more broadly, the library company's graphics collection. To facilitate this discussion, Erica and I have prepared a few questions that we will begin with. We, but we have built time in at the end of this event for your questions and comments as well. Please feel free to put those into the question Q&A. So to get us started, we were wondering if you could choose a few items from the Imperfect History Exhibition that you find particularly compelling and tell us why you chose them. Sure, so hello everyone. Um, and thank you, Sarah, for that really nice introduction and Erica for yours as well. And I'll just start by saying I'm, I'm super happy to be here and grateful for the opportunity to take a, a fun dive into imperfect history. Um, so yeah, I'm pleased to start with your first question. Um, combing through the exhibition, I found uh, more than two images that I found particularly compelling, but I'll try to restrain myself. And uh, we'll start with the image that's on the screen. So this is a silhouette of the Lee family of Philadelphia that was purported to have been uh, made by the esteemed silhouette artist, Augustine Edouard. Um, and was donated to the library in 1977 by a woman named Elizabeth Lee Oliver. So someone who shared the same name as the family who's portrayed in the silhouette. So I chose this uh, because I just have a natural attraction to silhouettes as an art form, as well as just high contrast, bold graphics in general. They always just tend to catch my eye. So I was naturally drawn to this object. And I think this just also happens to be an image that invites close looking. It almost makes me feel like a voyeur who's kind of peeping into someone's living room and seeing something that maybe I'm not supposed to see. And it also feels a little bit like watching television, perhaps because of the format of the, the piece. So the more I look at it, and the more closely I look at it, you start to see all sorts of kind of strange things going on in the image. So Erica, if you could use that magnifying glass to kind of look on the background on the right hand side. And I'll tell you when to stop down. So down a little bit, I'm going for the baby right there. Yep. <laughs> So um, this baby is kind of being used as a bridge, or you could say that two chairs are you, that are uh, positioned face to face are being used as a kind of a makeshift crib. And the baby looks a little bit helpless back there. And um, its arms are kind of reaching up, perhaps looking for support or probably you know, more likely just kind of a function of how silhouettes need, need to work. But then you look some more. Um, so Erica, if you could scroll to kind of the leftish foreground and there's where there's another baby. Yes, <laughs> another helpless baby on the floor with its arms in the same position. Um, and apparently no adults paying attention to either of those babies. And then finally, uh, if you go to the left background right there, yes. <laughs> a seemingly unattended child who's yielding a whip to uh, whip the person, the adult that's that's standing in front of them. So there's there are a lot of really fun things to observe about this silhouette. So 
But then I spent a time looking at it without reading the label or kind of paying attention to what section of the exhibition it was in. Then I read the label and I find out that it is not an actual silhouette, but it's a fake. And I believe Sarah, this, this was your object. And so the label says that um, when it was received by the library company as a gift, it was, it was fully believed to be an original silhouette by Edouard, but only years later when it was removed from its frame, did uh, curators realize that it was actually a doctored photograph of a silhouette. And I think a skillfully doctored photograph as well. So that invited me to look at it even more and even more closely and to see if I could see something that perhaps um, made it obvious that it was a doctored photograph rather than an original. And whoever did this kind of doctored photograph did a, re a really good job because I couldn't, I'm no expert in this, but I couldn't, I couldn't tell that it was a fake. So Considering that it's a, a fake, that raised a lot of a lot of other questions for me. So I'm I'm assuming that the donor uh, was a descendant of the family that's that's depicted in the silhouette um, because she shared a surname in common with them. And if so, could she have known that it was a photograph when she donated it? And then considering that. Could it actually have been kind of a thing that was done? So since this was originally a one of a kind piece, was creating these doctored uh, photographs of silhouettes a sort of art form that allowed the original to be duplicated and shared with other family members? Or was it intended to deceive in a more kind of uh, deceitful way? And then uh, how does, the knowledge of it being a photograph change its value or estimation to the graphic arts department and the way you talk about it with the public. Does it, is it as valuable as an original silhouette or is it just valuable, perhaps in an, as valuable in a different way? I'm not sure we have time for Sarah to, to answer any of those questions. You tossed out a lot of questions there. Um, and I guess I can just really briefly say I, based on how it was received in the 1977 annual report of the library company, um, they certainly did not think or have any knowledge that it was not an original silhouette. It was lauded as you know a really wonderful acquisition. And actually this is one of two that came in from the same woman at the same time. Um, the other one was also of the it was Joseph Lee and Sarah Robertson Lee with their unmarried children. Um, so it was 11 adults. It didn't include any actual children, children. Um, and I guess I would be surprised since the person who donated it gave other materials to the library company, to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, all of which were genuine materials. They were daguerreotypes and other things that actually were what she was presenting them as, I would be surprised if she realized that it wasn't an original silhouette um, or that her family, I, I don't think there was any you know, sense of trying to deceive or, or anything yeah. like that going on. Yeah, if I add to this, this story, um, this actually was found in what we have a, a little <laughs> Secrets, a, a, draw, a drawer called Minor Miscellaneous. And that's sort of where material goes that is not necessarily going to be cataloged or we feel is not necessarily going to make it into like the, the prime time collections in the in the garden department. And I found that I can't, uh, a few years back, I mean, uh, when I say a few years now, sometimes I think it's five and it was like 10 years ago. And I thought they were really interesting. And I think I initially thought they were true silhouettes. It was, you know, hand, you know, painted silhouette. And then... <laughs> I sort of looked at it more. I'm like, oh, this is a photograph. 
Um, and then it was through the course of doing research for imperfect history, kind of finding what the citation that Sarah was um, mentioning, I think it was in 1977 OM or something, but talking about like, oh, we got these great silhouettes in, and, um, and then, you know, the discovery shouldn't make it back into the OM, sort of like, oh, no, they're, they're, they're photographs. And then I guess, you know, apparently they wound up in the minor miscellaneous drawer, but we have taken them out of the minor miscellaneous drawer, they're cataloged. And I'm I'm glad to to see um, you know the interest that they they brought to you Emily and um, to Sarah. Yeah. yeah. And to me, you know, the fact that they were put in the imperfect or this one was put in the imperfect section of the exhibition. Mm -hmm. I, the point I kind of wanted to make was, you know, the curators make mistakes. You know, things yeah. are not yeah. always what they appear. You know, close sure. looking will often lead to you know really interesting um, discoveries. Sometimes things that you maybe don't make you happy, but, but it nonetheless are worth, you know, pursuing. Yeah. Yeah. I think fakes have a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, information to share, you know, have interesting value. It's funny because I, I know we're using the, the term fake, which fair enough, but I guess I would think it's, it's a reproduction of <laughs> the silhouettes like what you said it was a reproduction probably that was meant to give, be given to other family members who didn't have the original um silhouette which they are at the philadelphia museum of art if i if i yeah. yes yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that's a nice way to put it <laughs> Instead of saying, i guess the enhancements you know to the photograph made me think that there was kind of some extra intent to um elevated above, you know, just a photographic reproduction. Mm -hmm. I guess in the interest of time, we should move on to, to my second choice. Um, so Erica, could you load the George Mark? Yes, yeah, that's the one. So I couldn't help myself but to choose two photographs for my second choice of the most compelling images. So the two photographs that I, I think work really well in conversation with one another. So this is the first one. And this is a photograph uh, by a man named George Mark Wilson. And it has a title that's uh, meant to be kind of, my perception of it is that it's meant to be an African-American dialect. It was uh, taken around 1923 in Philadelphia and it's included in the curatorial space and place section of the exhibition. I was originally drawn to this photograph through a blog post by the Imperfect History Curatorial Fellow, Kanaya Hassan. And her blog post is titled, uh, Reconfiguring the Gaze. And I, I very much recommend it if, uh, if participants haven't read it yet. So in the post, uh, Kanaya talks about how exotic objects displayed in cabinets of curiosity and early encyclopedic museums allowed white Europeans and Americans to, as she so eloquently phrased it, cast a penetrating gaze toward the other. She then goes on to kind of draw connections to the camera as a type of new technology that aided uh, colonizers and imperialistic explorers uh, to objectify people through photographs of non-white subjects taken by white photographers. She then somewhat, somewhat brilliantly uh, notes that this is the very same type of photography um, that we're seeing here now, taking place on the streets of Philadelphia. And so this is a photograph. Um, if you could use that magnifying glass to zoom in on the, the human in the photograph. So this is a photograph um, of an unnamed African-American woman in 1923. Thanks to the photographer's notes about this photograph, we also know that a conversation took place between the photographer and this woman. Apparently she called him out for taking this photograph uh, without kind of her consent and taking a photograph of the building as well. And um, then she either obliged and let him take the photo or, and or kind of gave up. But even without these notes, it would have been, I think, obvious to most viewers that through her body language that, that she's not super comfortable with this situation. So um, Erica, could you jump over to the uh, John Frank Keith portrait? Yeah. Okay. It's in the 
Are you seeing the job for Keith or is that not working? Not yet. Okay. Yeah, I think I need to, I, yeah, I, I think no. I messed up. Yeah. Let okay. me see if I can, yeah. <laughs> Let me see if I can get to it. It's a little less eloquent, but. In the imperfection section. Have to move your your head. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there he is. Okay, thank you. Yep. So this is a a photograph uh, by a man named John Frank Keith, and it's of a named subject. Uh, you can see his name written right there on the bottom of the picture. His name was Walt Wright. And we know that the photograph was taken around 1930. So if you can imagine these two photographs uh, placed next to one another, I think it, it raises some, some interesting questions. Um, let me back up a little bit and say what we know about uh, Walt Bright um, was that these photographs were taken in South Philadelphia, and I believe that most of them were of, of working class Philadelphians in that kind of region of the city. Mm -hmm. So again, imagine this photogra photograph next to uh, the one we previ previously saw of the African American woman. And consider their titles. So this title has the kind of assigned uh, title of Portrait of Walt Bright. Whereas the other one has a title that, that correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah and Erica, is an African-American dialect and was probably assigned by the photographer himself. But, you know, for me, it raises the questions, are they both portraits? And if so, uh, if not, why not? And if so, how? And what, you know, what is a portrait? Um, I guess to me, portraits imply some level of consent and agency in kind of choosing how your image is being made. And we don't necessarily see that in, in the previous, previous image, but I think we get a stronger sense of that through this portrait of Walt Bright. Also, it's really interesting to compare the body language of, of the two sub photographic subjects. So to me, of uh, Walt Bright looks a little more comfortable, a lot more comfortable having his photograph taken and almost proud to have it done. You know, it, the way he's dressed made me wonder if he knew he was going to have his photograph taken that day. You know, and he's holding his shoulders back. He took off his hat, which indicates kind of a level of formality. Um, whereas uh, the subject in the other photograph is standing at a distance, again, probably not her choice, uh, with her arms tightly crossed, and she appears to have kind of a scowl on her face. I also think it's really interesting to, to have the opportunity to think about their clothing and uh, their connection to their surroundings. So what perhaps does her clothing tell us about her connection to the building that she is either guarding or just kind of standing near? And then what does his clothing say kind of about his position in life? So really wonderful selections for this exhibition and a kind of a delight for me to, to think through. And I'm happy for, for either Sarah or Erica to add any, anything or correct me where I might have been, <laughs> might have been wrong. No, I guess I'm just concerned. I want to make sure that we have a chance to really get through a lot of the questions. I'm afraid if we do a lot of talking, that's not going to happen. So I don't know if we should just okay. keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So the next question was one that I wanted to, to pose to, to Emily. And it's how has the Imperfect History exhibition affected your understanding of the collecting scope of the graphic arts collection? Yeah. Um, again, I'm, I'm really grateful that this exhibition coincides with my first year at the library company because it's almost functioned as kind of a, a tutorial for me to learn about uh, just how rich and deep the, the collection is and all the various formats that uh, you've chosen to include in the collection. I um, also really like the way you 
especially within the inception, collection, and reception part of, of the exhibition, the way you kind of drew um, uh, exhibition viewers in by posing questions about different images and helped us kind of understand what we can ask of those images. And uh, that allows them to be, you know, to be perhaps more palatable for some, for some of the more difficult images um, or more interesting for people who uh, perhaps looked at an image and didn't find anything of interest and then read your questions and said, oh yeah, this really helps me kind of understand what, what is possible to be seen in this image. I'm kind of abbreviating my answer for this question and then in the interest of time, but I was also super interested to learn uh, the breadth of our scrapbook collections and kind of what, what uh, scrapbooks get into the graphic arts department as opposed to which ones end up in other collections and uh, also how um, past stewards of the library company collections chose to use scrapbooks as a housing strategy for loose graphic arts. So. An unfortunate but hopefully reversible uh, decision. <laughs> I think I'll leave it at that. I have more to say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I guess that actually you're, you're discussing a scrapbooks is sort of a good lead in potentially to the next question that I had was, you know, are there any items or, or types of items that got included in Imperfect History that you were surprised to learn more part of the graphics collection. I guess you were starting to answer that by saying scrapbooks. Um, so I guess yeah. you could also respond, you know, the flip side of that is, are there unexpected omissions to, to what appeared in the exhibition or even to, to what is in the, the graphic arts collection? Yeah, yeah, I have, I have one example of something that was kind of a surprise and it, it's the object you see on the screen here. So this is a scrapbook, and but it, it's kind of unusual. Uh, it's something librarians see occasionally. It's a scrapbook uh, that was made out of a geography textbook. So it's a circa 1873 to 1875. So basically, the uh, the maker took a, a textbook that actually had rules printed in it that said, "Do not deface or defile this book." And they said, what the heck, we're going to <laughs> turn it into a scrapbook and enhance its artistic value by, uh, you know, cutting out figures from, from magazines and putting them kind of in different compositions on the pages of this old textbook. So I guess I shouldn't be surprised that it's in the graphic arts collection, but I also wondered if, you know, if there would be any value to kind of having it cataloged as, as a book as well as a published book you know, published book and having it kind of uh, play a role in both the printed book collection and graphic arts. I call this kind of thing an entangled object and I, I'm super fascinated by, by uh, such things. As far as an omission, um, I think kind of a category of items that I, I wondered if you thought about including in the section of the exhibition that, that's called Things Curators Love to Hate and Hate to Love, which is a really fun, fun section. So one of the things that maybe I've hated to love and love to hate in, in my role are kind of greatest hits items within the collection, the ones that every group that comes to the library wants to see that you have to get out over and over again and uh, do the same, you know, variations on the same spiel about them over and over again. And uh, that, you know, sometimes we do that because we really like something and there's a lot to say about it, but some, you know, there are other kind of less interesting reasons. So this is, this is the example I chose of, of one of the graphic arts department's greatest hits. It's Joseph Brightnell's albums of uh, nature prints, which are just have a remarkable story to tell. And I kind of wondered, Sarah and Erica, if you if you considered that angle when uh, when selecting items for that section. 
I, I could be really crass and say, well, the problem with the bright now leaf prints is that they're large. And sometimes what dictates your decisions when you're curating an exhibition is how much space you have in a case or on the wall. Um, that obviously is not the only guiding principle, but um, I don't know. I don't pull these out as often as perhaps one might think. Um, so I don't know if Erica, you want to, I mean, there are certainly other things that yes, there definitely are the greatest hits that, that are constantly being asked. They're the things that are reproduced the most often. They're the things that people associate with the collection and therefore say, oh, I would love to see X because that's the only you know, one of three things that they know the library company has. And then you do feel a sense of obligation to, to drag it out. And then after a while you do feel resentful because you're bored with it, no matter how wonderful it might be, you're just tired of it. Yeah, um, for me, I, I think, you know, thinking back to, if you if you have, uh, you look at our online exhibition or come to the exhibition on site in the introduction, we talk about this exhibition sort of showing you kind of the, the hidden materials in our collection or the hidden lives of the materials in our collection. And I feel like, you know, Bright Knowles is part of our Court of the Millennium volume. Um, it's often pulled for um, classes. Uh, it, it, like you said, it seems I just like realized it's, that you have it's it in your background. It's your background. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's your background as well. So, Sarah, obviously, there is a subconscious love of the Bright Knowles prints. Um, that she was not wanting to admit to. Um, but I, I think for me, what I was trying to do was, you know, find the right balance of, you know, showing material, materials that, you know, have been hidden and deserve to have sort of, you know, um, have them be highlighted or showcased, uh, showcased as sort of, you know, an um, unrealized um, greatest hit, uh, but also balance that with uh, materials that, um, you know, that are pulled um, often uh, I, I don't want to call it a greatest hit, uh, but like our life in Philadelphia collection, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's a it's a race series uh, of caricatures of the middle class African American community um, in early 19th century Philadelphia. Um, so I felt, you know, again, those are often a pull for many of our um, fellows, our, our researchers looking at African Amer the African American community in Philadelphia in the early 19th century. And it is, um, you know, sensitive material. But I felt, you know, like that, you know, that was something I felt like should be that needed to be um, in the collection to sort of, you know, reflect, you know, what our holdings are at the Library Company of Philadelphia and thinking about, you know, that question that we were asking in the video, or I was asking, you know, think about what people saw when they looked at it in 1829 and what we see when we're looking at it in, in 20. Um, 21. So that's an elongated um, answer um, to your question about why the Brayton all leaf prints did not <laughs> did not make their their way um, into the into the exhibition. And I think I'm just checking on time. Um, I must admit, in our schedule, this is the time that you were supposed to be asking us, uh, Emily, um, questions. But I feel like yeah. you've been asking us questions. So if you don't mind, I was going to ask uh, another uh, question that we had. Um, post um, to you. Um, and I think I'm, um, again, given um, the time, uh, I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna skip a little bit and ask okay. if, if you could add one book from the library company's collections to the exhibition, what would it be and why was that title chosen? Yeah, is it okay if I share my screen then? Yeah, I, I must admit I hid my um, my my toolbars. So I don't know if, if uh, um, Blanche, if you can stop sharing my screen because I can't figure out how to um, do it at this point. <laughs> yes, I think I can force you out. <laughs> oh, you can't, okay. Yeah, all right. So, um, thank you. <laughs> we're gonna skip this first image. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, never mind that, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> another, another event. Um, so I had a really fun time with this question. Uh, you know, I have a lot of um, a lot of the books at Winterthur were heavily visual. So, you know, that's a strong interest and, and passion of mine are, are books that are full of wonderful illustrations. So um, I chose first I went into the collections looking for a book that's described as being extra illustrated. So kind of a normal published book that's full of mainly text but uh, in which the owner has supplemented the text with prints, uh, letters, all sorts of extra bits to kind of uh, illustrate um, what's being relayed through the text. 
Library company being the library company, I found 56 examples of extra illustrated books. And this was, this was one of them, even though I, I don't quite agree that it falls neatly into that category. This is a really wonderful copy of A.J. Downing's Rural, Rural Residences, which was published, intended to be published in parts, uh, I believe beginning in 1837. And this was a gift of uh, Dr. Anthony Garvin in 1978. It is a unique and special copy. Um, as many copies of this book are, most of them are kind of compilations of the original prints by A.J. Downing supplemented with uh, um, other works. But our copy uh, seems to be extra special. It has this uh, manuscript list of its contents it has some of Downing's original chromo, I believe those are hand colored uh, lithographs or chromo lithographic prints of his architectural designs. It has original watercolors of uh, that I believe were his AJ Downing's designs as well and floor plans. And the reason I I wanted to propose it as a possible uh, late inclusion into an imperfect history was because of the information that could be drawn out of some of the illustrations if, it, if this object belonged to the graphic arts department instead of the print and book collection. So for example, um, this is an original drawing of an estate in Virginia that's called Bellme. And I just happened to choose this, this particular uh, property to to Google it to see kind of if it still stands. And I wondered kind of what it looked like today. And I found out that it has this really fascinating history. Uh, it was built as a plantation. Um, sorry, I can't remember the year right now, 1840s, I believe. And uh, at the time of its, um, in its early years, there were over 250 people enslaved on the property. It was later sold to two sisters who, uh, one of them was one of the first women to be canonized in the United States. And they turned this property into schools for African-American children and Native American children. And I kind of thought by, because of the, the level, high level of cataloging that you do in graphic arts that you could draw out those kind of details that would give this this object uh, relevance and interest to um, people studying African American history and other topics that kind of are within the satellite of these illustrations. I don't, I couldn't decide what section of the exhibition I uh, wanted to <laughs> put it in, but there's my choice. <laughs> oh, thank you. I would just, as time goes by, that's the section I would. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's a great book that I have to say I've never pulled off the shelf to look at. So this this is new to me. So thank you very much for, for yeah. sharing, it, Emily. I'll go ahead um, and stop sharing my screen now. And I have one more question uh, before we move on. And I think it, it's um, one that takes us a little bit past just the Imperfect History exhibition, which might be of interest. And that was to ask you, Emily, how you thought that maybe the library could take some of the themes of imperfect history. For example, that the, an institution and curators do not speak in a neutral voice or, and the importance of visual literacy and critical thinking skills. And how can the library incorporate them into sort of a moving forward into areas beyond the graphics collection if you see that as a, a valid thing to, to be pursuing? You know, we, we've talked uh, a bit in my time here about kind of establishing core values for the, you know, for at least the collection staff or the library company as a whole. And, and I, I thought about that as I was thinking about how to answer this question. And I, I realized that I think Imperfect History kind of clearly uh, delineate some of the core values that, that I think could easily be applied to, could be, uh, become standards for future exhibitions and programming. So um, I think 
your concept and your title um, not only represents the history of the graphic arts collection and, and department, but can serve as a descriptor for the library company as a whole. We are, an, you know, we have an imperfect history across the board. And by looking at our collections in the way that you've chosen to do with imperfect history and applying those kind of lenses to uh, objects included in future exhibitions and the way we shape and design programs, um, I think that's how we can, can kind of sustain all of the good, the good work um, and the important stuff that you've accomplished through this exhibition. So I think we, we do have a, a few minutes if you want to ask us. I know you had a couple questions for us, um, Emily, so maybe if you want to stick to one of those questions and then we'll open the, the floor um, to our audience. Okay, um, so I think you almost answered both of my questions in the video, but I think I'll go with the second question. Um, here goes. So thanks to the excellent reputations of the Graphic Arts Collection and its curators, you receive a, a whole lot of interesting and extraordinary gift offers. One of the essays in the Imperfect History publication discusses a collection of trade cards that was donated to the library by David Dorette and Linda G. Mitchell in 2017. The Gwen Goldman collection includes over 300 trade cards with a focus on African-American imagery that as you describe it, quote, informed and reflected the racism of the era in which they were created. I'm curious about your thought process when you received gift, gift offers such as these. What are your considerations when adding these kind of challenging materials to the collection? Does cataloging the description play any kind of role in uh, your decision? And how do you prepare to share such materials with the public who may have little context for them? Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll take this on since that's my, <laughs> and I, that was my essay um, in the um, exhibition uh, publication. Um, so I, I think this, you know, as I mentioned in the, the video that was um, shown at the beginning um, of this, this program, a lot of our, of our materials, our collections date to the 19th century. And so that's you know, part of our collecting scope. And so you know, materials that we bring into our collection, we want to you know, keep into that collecting scope. Uh, and so sadly in the 19th century, most representation portrayals of the African-American black community are um, racist caricatures and satires um, as opposed to um, more uh, uh, individualistic um, um, imagery. Um, so that, in a way, we can't, if we're going to have materials about African-American visual culture in our collection, sort of the sad truth is that most of those materials are going to be this racist material as opposed to, to something else. Um, and, I, and I do, and as Kanaya sort of, you know, was talking about with the trade cards, that kind of visual imagery became normative in that, that period of time, those stereotypes and those um, caricatures. So in recent years, we, are for, we do have what uh, termed counter archives, and that's also part of the, um, the art, um, part of that essay uh, that you're, you're talking about with Gwen Goldman. And so the Stephen Cogdell Sanders Venning Collection, which is a part of the Imperfect History Exhibition, is a collection that it, it's a family collection. Um, it's a multiracial family that descended from uh, a white, um, a Southern uh, white merchant who had a relationship with a young enslaved woman in his household. And so part of the collection are several portrait photographs of the family dating from the mid 19th century up to the, the mid 20th century. And so these are often their um, photographs that aren't, aren't always necessarily um, taken by um, African-American or black um, photographers, there are several snapshots. So there's probably a good chance that are family members who took those images or um, acquaintances. But those are, you know, photographs, there is um, sort of indexical quality to it that you're not gonna see in, in a trade card where you, it is, an, if, you know, an intervention mediation. And typically those trade cards are done by, we're white creators who are creating those, um, those images. So in, in terms of thinking about cataloging those materials, I will admit that I, um, they are part of our African American history graphics collection and that is a collection that I first cataloged over 20 years ago at this point. That was a time where you didn't really have digital catalogs. Um, and but the library company has always um, 
for the most part with our graphics catalog and a tradition of writing very robust descriptions. So I think, you know, writing those descriptions really helps with the, to understand the context of these um, material, trying to place them in a context. But even then, um, you know, the, sort of the word choices that were being used are not the word choices that I would use today. You know, anti-racist description. I think it was uh, it was sort of just considered that was um, kind of you know organically happening to, over 20 years ago. But you know, word choice matters uh, at that period of time. You know, using the term um, slave instead of like enslaved person or enslaved woman, enslaved man, um, or uh, you know, runaway slave versus freedom seeker, um, or you know, using the term mal -pro malapropisms for for language as opposed to vernacular. Um, so I mean, I think you know. Matter, especially now when, with a digital catalog where you have the images and the words um, sort of together, I think you know even it, it hits home even more. Um, and I also just wanted to to mention that we are uh, at the library company now creating a race and visual culture digital collection to complement our African history graphics um, collection. So that is a thought process that we're um, going through now. Um, and more recently, what I was not necessarily doing in the past is, is calling out an image as racist, like in the description, I'll say racist image, uh, using the subject heading racism in popular culture. Um, so that is something that has also evolved in my years and, and at the library company working with um, the material. And we also now have a harmful material statement um, on our um, website. So, I mean, I don't think we, we were not, not mindful of this over 20 years ago. But again, sort of in the way that you're looking at a, a material, I mean, have the society and the culture that you're in at, at that at this moment, you know, changes how you're going to you know, work with these materials and look at these materials and provide access to those materials. And I think that's a good thing to have that evolution. And I'm also conscious missteps will be made, but um, I, I, this is not my quote. I don't know who's original, but it's sort of like you you know you're moving forward if you have a misstep because if, if you're just standing still, there are not going to be any missteps. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's a that's a good thing. So I know I've talked a lot. Uh, so let me stop. And um, I know I think I, I see some um, questions in um, the Q and A um, that we can um, get to. And we will try to be mindful of time. I know it's sort of I mean, it's like six twenty four, but if, if people don't mind, maybe we'll just hang on for like another five minutes and have this run till six thirty five instead of um, six thirty. But we completely understand if you need to need to get going. Um, um, I've been looking at some of the questions okay. as you were talking, Erica, not that I wasn't listening to you. No, no, well. no, no, please feel free. Multitasking. Um, and it does seem like some of them are questions that have been answered. Um, uh, although we, here's one for you, Emily. Um, someone is asking, are you a fan of Kara Walker? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, I love her work. I saw... Um, a traveling exhibition of, of her silhouettes that was at the Birmingham Museum of Art a few years ago. I'm not sure where else it went to, but yeah, yeah, wonderful work. Wow. And um, the same person asked about um, how was the silhouette doctored? Um, has anyone found the original? And that was answered um, in that the originals are at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and were given, I believe, in 2012. Um, were the positions of the people changed? And no, it was not doctored that much. It simply was, you know, adding ink, I think, to, you know, bring out the silhouettes, maybe to add some details to the silhouettes as well, um, is my recollection of what had happened. That's what it looked like to, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, someone is asking for the title of Kanaya's blog essay, um, was it Reconfiguring the Gaze? Reconfiguring the Gaze, yeah. Um, okay. I think that the search function on the library company website would allow you to, to pull it up pretty easily if you search that title. Mm -hmm. We have a question about um, what innovations have been made in cataloging to identify material containing racist tropes as not African American. Isn't that material white American? Yeah. So uh, in response, I mean, um, 
that's sort of the race and visual culture digital um, collection because that point has been made, which is is, is fair that you know, can it be considered African American history if it's white <laughs> white folks uh, you know portrayals of the African American um, um, community? But I think you you know more can be done, and I must be it is not. You know, when I do a catalog record, is I, I don't say something like, you know, white create, you know, I have the name of the 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 artists, the publishers. Um, and, you know, that's something that you could look and find that these are 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 white individuals, but it's not signified in any other way. So that you know, that is a, that is a point um to be um had. Um this is again you know, navigate there are cataloging standards and us still trying to ca uh, navigate the cataloging standards that are universal standards that are to be used by all catalogers, but also um thinking about you know using more um local headings or um local um standards to 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 work with the material. So there's still definitely um room to to grow there. Uh we have someone asking saying that they would love to hear more about how scrapbooks were used as storage methods for graphic. <laughs> content in the collection. You can read all about it on the online exhibition, <laughs> or at least just a, a little snippet about it. Um, yeah. Was there a blog post on, on, on that to dive there, into that practice? Or? Is there, no, just there wasn't kind of a, a, a blog post, uh, but that, that was sort of a, a section that I really wanted to be a part of the, the exhibition um, because it, it, it's just, it was sort of amazing to me this so like scrapbooks and albums came into the, the collections and that, some of that material was coming in in the mid um, 19th um, century. There was a dark Charles Augustus Paulson gave us um, several scrapbooks, including a scrapbook of Philadelphia um, images. Um, so it's in a scrapbook. Then by the later 19th century, I think as we were getting more graphic materials into the library company, you know, it was sort of like, well, this is a great way to, to store and preserve and to sort of arrange these materials. So they would just sort of start, you know, I'll say through, slapping them, you know, pasting them into um, to, to scrapbooks, um, which would have generic titles like scrapbook of engravings and something that's in the exhibition is actually a lithograph. So it's not even an engraving. So they were just sort of, you know, trying to find some general subject matter. Then uh, in the, when the graphic um, arts department was formed in 1971, those materials were being taken out of the scrapbook because that really wasn't the best way to preserve it, really to provide access to it. So they were coming back out of the, the, the scrapbook at that point. And Sarah has an item in the um, exhibition, which is one of the first few known uh, um, uh, graphic materials that we know that was actively, proactively acquired by the library company. Um, by John Moran, a uh, Philadelphia photographer. And at some point, the backs of the photos were being used as an institutional archive. So library company photos were getting um, placed on, on the back of them. And Sarah, I love it, she pointed out how on the title page of that album, it'll say like, you know, it's like John Moran's, and you can correct me, Sarah, like photographs of Philadelphia. And then it's like, it's and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> like that's, that's, so they were indicating that it, it wasn't just John Moran photographs um, anymore. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, and, 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 and today when a, a scrapbook comes into our collections, for the most part, we do try to keep it together um, to, to maintain it's like original order, the, you know, um, you know, the integrity of, of, of that piece. So it's sort of, you know, this changing of, you know, how to, to work with um, um, scrapbooks. We also work with our conservation department. Sometimes it makes sense to sort of you know, take pages out of the, the binding, but keep the materials on the pages. So that's a very long-winded answer, <laughs> probably more than you wanted to know about storage <laughs> methods. Definitely <laughs> a, a mixed blessing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, come in many forms. And um, we have an attendee who was asking about where she could find your essay, Erica, and I think that is an important thing to mention that um, there is um, a catalog of essays accompanying Imperfect History, which has the clever title of Imperfect <laughs> History. Um, and it is um, a physical catalog that is available. You can, it's free. Um, you can pick it up from the library company, or if you wanted to order a copy, it's still free, but I believe we are asking um, you to cover uh, shipping costs. And I don't know how much they are, but our if you contacted us, we could certainly get a copy sent to you. Um, we have a question. What kind of photograph is the Lee family image? Um, I believe it's a gelatin silver photograph. Um, it's my recollection. Um, 
it certainly will say that on the label in the exhibition <laughs> and on the online oh. exhibition. And I, yeah, that's what I it does say that I have that okay. here. Delicate <laughs> silver print with ink. <laughs> I got that right. Yay. Um, and also someone has a observation saying, I wonder if the child in the silhouette is perhaps whipping the toy horse on which he's riding rather than the man proximate to him. Let's hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or, I guess it's, it's not, <laughs> neither is a good scenario. But I think that again speaks to the multiple perspectives that, and you know, one's own perception read what you want into images sometimes <laughs> the fun of it like you potentially know that's not necessarily what the artist was thinking but that's what I'm seeing so is that any less valid in a way right I mean I yeah, I, yeah so I think it's always interesting okay that seems to be the questions and comments that I am seeing um and since it is 6 32 um I think probably should we should wrap things up so having said that, um, I just want to say, I, I think this has been a really um, thought provoking event. Um, I want to extend a, a big thank you to Emily Guthrie for her insightful comments and to my other library company colleagues, Erica Piola, my co-curator for the Imperfect History exhibition and to Blanche Brown, our events and planning coordinator who kept this event running smoothly behind the scenes. And a thank you to all of you as well for your attention over the last hour, and particularly to those of you who made comments and asked such great questions. And I'd like to end by inviting you all to attend our upcoming uh, free Imperfect History Symposium entitled Collecting, Curating, and Consuming American Popular Graphic Arts Yesterday and Today, which will be held virtually on February, uh, February, <laughs> Friday, Friday, March 25th. Um, we've assembled an impressive array of curators, academics, and graduate students as speakers for the symposium, and I do hope that you will join us. So once again, thank you very much, and have a good night. <laughs>